What's up, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 650. Today, I have two guests, siblings, Sensei Samuel Diaz III and Senpai Angel Diaz. And they're here to talk about, well, they're going to tell their stories. They're going to talk about family dynamics, training together, and a whole bunch of other things. It's a fun episode. And it's actually one of the first interview episodes that we've ever done in video. So if you're listening and you'd rather check it out in video, go ahead, stop now, because there's, there's, there's plenty to see in the video, facial expressions, the humor. This is a great episode. Now, if you're new to the show, thanks for watching. Thanks for coming by, listening, supporting us, because we're here on a mission. We are here to connect, educate, and entertain the martial artists of the world, specifically the traditional martial artists. I'm a passionate traditional martial artist myself, and that's why we do all the things that we do here at Whistlekick. If you want to check out everything that we've got going on, please go to whistlekick.com. One of the things you'll find over there is our store. And if you use the code PODCAST15, that's going to get you 15% off every single thing we have in the store from great apparel, coffee mugs, protective equipment, training programs. There's a bunch of stuff there. So check it out. Now, we've also got whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. That's where you're going to find everything for this show. We've done 650 episodes. They're all available for free. You can find them in your podcast player and you can find them at our website. We also include at the website transcripts, photos, links, all kinds of good stuff over there. You can also sign up for our newsletter. Now, if the stuff that we do means something to you and you want to support us, tons of ways you can support us, but I'm going to give you just a couple. One, you can leave a review, whether it's Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts, Spotify, any place that you could leave a review for Whistlekick or Martial Arts Radio is greatly appreciated. Two, you could tell someone about what we've got going on. How do we grow? Through word of mouth. The friends of the show, sharing the show with other people has been the most significant way that we've grown over the years. And then three, we have a Patreon. Patreon.com slash Patreon.com slash Whistlekick. There we go. It's a tongue twister. P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Whistlekick. We bring you additional behind the scenes, exclusive content for our Patreon contributors. You can start as little as $2 a month and it goes up from there. We very rarely have people drop out of the Patreon, which tells me we're doing the right thing with delivering value. But without further ado, let's talk to our guests, Senpai and Sensei, T.S. Sam Angel, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you so much for having us. This is is exciting. Yeah, thank you so much. This is awesome. What what a pleasure to be here. you know, it's it's been a while. I haven't seen you guys in person. I felt like there was like a two year span. Didn't matter where I turned, if there was a tournament, if if the whistle kick team was there, if we had a booth, just you you guys were there. Honestly, I Angel, I feel like I met you first, but I don't even remember when that happened. I think just somehow we skipped the part where we didn't know each other, <laughs> and then just you were there and we were old friends. Yeah. No, uh, it, we definitely, so I remember when it was, it was uh, the Epon uh, opener. It was 2017 was when I met you. Uh, okay. Met you, you pulled me right after the end of the tournament. And the first thing you said was, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like something I would do. It yeah. really does. So yeah, we met there. And then just ever since then, our paths have crossed just throughout the years. Awesome. Yeah, well, you guys, you guys are doing some cool stuff, some big stuff. And the audience, whether they're watching or they're listening right now, you know, maybe they skipped ahead of the intro, so they don't know what I what I set up in the intro. But this is different. We're doing a Monday show with two people. We haven't, I think we've done like maybe two of those ever. So this is this is kind of special. And I mean, let's let's get it out of the way. You're related. <laughs> as closely as possible. <laughs> Yeah, like we're all, this is, this is Sam speaking now for people that are, that are on audio, um, but, but yeah, we're brothers 11 years apart and, uh, and we just pushing each other. Yeah. Like mm. the gap, as we've gotten older, the gap has, has gotten smaller, so to say, yeah. in terms of, of how this, how this works out, the relationship and stuff, which is great. It's a blessing. Right on, right on. So let's, let's roll it back. Let's, you know, we, we, we think of this in a lot of different ways. You know, the first episode of your TV show, your origin story of your comic book, whatever it is, you know, 
<laughs> Angel's, do, Angel's doing a little shimmy. He's getting excited to talk about this. So if with an 11 year gap, I'm going to guess that your martial arts initiation wasn't at the same time. So how did it happen? Well, um, well, for myself, I started training when I was two and a half. So this is, again, for listeners that popped in now, this is uh, Sam speaking. Um, I started training at two and a half. And it all really early. because I wanted to be a Ninja Turtle, you know, <laughs> what it's like the, the typical story that most kids yeah. that age have, they want to be some kind of superhero. Um, but it was ironic, or it was interesting, because it was night at that time, it was 1988. And, um, and there wasn't many martial arts schools that were taking children at two and a half years old, you know, that was uncommon. Mm -hmm. So um, my mother actually was the was the blessing because my father wanted me to do it. But he's like, Oh, he's still too young. And my mom's like, he doesn't stop talking about it. We're going to find a place. And she ended up finding a school in, in the projects and Papuanics projects in Bridgeport, Connecticut, that the instructor was uh, Maddie Malisi. And he would, and he said, you know, let's see if he pays attention, <laughs> like basically. And from there, you know, it's just, I fell right in, wanted to do everything the bigger kids were doing. Um, did it at a slower pace, obviously on the side with with a, a pseudo instructor, his name's Ishmael Herrera, who he ended up becoming my big brother. We're still, we're tight like this. He's family now. He, at one point in time, he was helping instruct at the dojo here when my father uh, had prostate cancer and had to take some time off. He came in to help me. Um, but, um, but yeah, it, it went from there. That's how it all started. And everything just kind of snowballed. And from training with, with Maddie Malisi, he gave me that, that um, intro to, to Shodokan Karate. And he also had a background in Goju. So it, it was a nice foundation that he gave me. And then from there, I went on to train um, with Shihan Errol Bennett out of the Bronx, New York. Um, he, he welcomed my father, welcomed me in. Um, because through me starting karate, I nagged my dad. And okay, my yeah, I, I thought I, I, thought oh, yeah, I heard I something. That part. How, yeah, how yeah. long? How um, long after you were training did, did dad step in? Probably, probably a year later, roughly. Yeah. A year or two later, um, he, he started up. It was funny because he, he makes a joke now. He doesn't want people to know that, like, I technically started first. But there's, like, my mom has this picture of him with a white belt and me with a green belt after a promotion. <laughs> like, you know, nice. some of funny things. But, but it definitely became a family affair. And um, it snowballed from there when we started training with, with Sheehan Bennett in, in the Bronx, New York. And then, you know, when Angel came along at, at two, three years old, I was trying to start him up. <laughs> and then what, what age did you actually start with? A, with so him? this is Angel speaking. Uh, I started karate in 2002 to 2003 school year. So I was in first grade. I was five years old. Um, I started because I saw my brother. So my dad and my brother used to go to the University of Bridgeport, uh, Wheeler Park and Rec. Mm -hmm. And they had a uh, wood gymnasium floor. It was a racquetball court. Mm -hmm. And they would go in there. And because my mom would work later hours, they just had to bring me. So my dad would just have me sit on the side and I watched them growing up. And then from there, my dad always, uh, I, I, my dad still does this to this day for some reason. Like the colder the weather is, the less he wants to be inside. <laughs> so he much rather train outside and we, we live right next to a parking lot. So he always trained in the parking lot, whether it was snowing, raining. It was, it could be the hottest day. He still has a hoodie on with gloves. He's hardcore. Oh, oh he's, he's hardcore. So <laughs> with him, I saw both of them doing it. And then kind of like the same thing. And just, I hit five years old and I just, I asked if I can do it. And my dad didn't even hesitate. Um, and I started, I started with my dad uh, and my brother first uh, before I went to, Shion Earl Bennett, um, and that was, he said he wanted me to be a little bit older before I came up, and then at eight years old, I went up to New York on a Monday night to Shion Earl Bennett for the first time, and then ever since then, okay. uh, that became the family trip, Monday, Wednesday, Sunday. That wow. Was a trip. Yeah. But how long was that drive? Uh, it's about, for us, it's about 45 minutes with no traffic, but okay. depending, so like when Angel was a baby, I was already training up there. So on Fridays, my father would pick me up from school, hop in the car, like, you know, take a quick nap on the ride up because you're going to train. And then my mom would come up to pick me up with him as a baby, with Angel as a baby, mm. come pick me up. And the ride home would be like an hour and a half, double the time. Wow. It was crazy. So it's a commitment. she would be driving and I would sit in the back and she would have me feed Angel the baby, <laughs> make the bottle, feed him. <laughs> but 
but it, it you know it was it's a blessing to have that much family investment into the martial arts you know my sure. parents value and, sure. and nowadays it's uncommon for somebody to, for a parent to say i'm gonna drive you 45 minutes to go do karate and yeah people are picking their martial arts schools based off of convenience mm-hmm. because it's the school that's at the end of the block or it's on my way home from work it's you know it's that it's not necessarily the quality of the school unfortunately and um and my parents you know with Shihan bennett he has his He's a, he's a monster. You know, he, <laughs> everybody who's anybody who came up in that blood and guts era of, of tournament karate knew him and, and has a story <laughs> about facing him or knew somebody who faced him or whatever. Sure. So they, they definitely saw the value in, and kept us both going there. Sure. You know, one of the things that, that we're kind of getting is a bonus that I didn't really expect is, is this aspect of your father in there. So, you know, Angel, by the time you start really at, you said eight, you know, there's already, well, let me do, let me do math, 17, 16, 17 years of training going on yeah, for yeah. you, Sam, before he gets going. Like that's, that's a lot. Like that's a commitment. We, we know you guys teach, you know, most of the people listening, watching, know very few people are going to train that long yeah. at, at all, right? Like ever in their entire lives, they're going to spend, yeah. they're not going to spend 17 years training. So yeah. the fact that we've got you who jumped in in at a, a in a really weird aspect, you know, two and a half. Yeah. You know who does that? <laughs> Your father follows along, Good and enough. he's sticking with it, and sees so much value in it that he's like, "All right, boys, we're we're driving. We're gonna drive. We're gonna put what's that? Close to ten hours a week into the car. Yeah. To mm-hmm. go get some quality instruction. Yeah. And you know, Angel, now you're sticking with it, so maybe not a martial arts question, but a family dynamic question. What is it about your family that you guys are that all in on stuff? Is it just martial arts? Or if we were to look at other aspects of your, your family, would we say, okay, like they bring that same discipline, that same mindset over here or over here? Yeah, uh, I, I would say hands down, it's across the board. Um, our family is super unique in the fact that we are all very, very active. So um, in addition to us all being martial artists, we are also all musicians. So my father, Angel, myself, um, and then my father and I play in a few different different salsa bands um, traveling for that. Wow. You know, and Angel used to play with us also um, before college and stuff. So it, you know, and the, so the discipline that we picked up in the martial arts transcends into everything that we do. And then a deeper layer under that is that our family is so close knit and we, we protect that energy a lot. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, families go through stuff. Everybody has their, their skeletons in the closet and whatever. And, you know, we have all went through things, but those things you you can allow it to make it, make you or break you. And, and it just always makes us stronger and stronger. And I do think that um, I, you know, I think that the foundation of that is in the training that we have on the floor. A lot of times when, when I'm at the dojo and I'm, I'm speaking with our students, you might, I don't know how, how well the mic is, but you might hear some key eyes in the background. <laughs> nice. Right now, class is going on. My father's teaching class. Oh, that's great. And, um, and one of the things that, I, that we all try to drive home with our students is that the training that you are embarking on in the floor, what you're enduring during that hour, hour and a half class, is a reflection of life. So the same way that you're facing a struggle during this training because your muscles are giving out, you're shaking, you're pushing yourself beyond limits, those are all going to be reflections of the trials, tribulations that we're going to face in life. Mm-hmm. And the discipline that you instill in yourself and how, how you polish your character in those moments on the floor are then going to support you later on when you're facing a really rough time at work or you're at school and college. Like, it was one time I remember I, I was uh, I went to for undergrad I went to Southern Connecticut State University and I was the captain of the karate team there and I got out of practice one day called my mom and I'm like crying because there was an economics class that I just couldn't like no matter how hard I studied I was still getting an F all the time mm. and, um, but you know she had to remind me at that time like what would you do if you were trading you just gonna cry because it's a tough time you figure it out and um, that's something that I think that's a staple for our family the foundation of our family yeah um, angel you agree uh yeah i'm gonna add a few more points to that so uh, i'm gonna look at it more from so my brother will give you the karate side and i'll give you like <laughs> the family side of it do it uh, do it so 
well, one thing I don't want to miss out on this component. So you're saying all three of us, but um, it's all four of us. Cause I always say this, my mom is a black belt. True. She even yeah. like, and my mom has done the cardio kickboxing clashes. Mm -hmm. Like she still <laughs> goes out on walks. Um, even with like his newborn baby, I called her the other day and I was like, what are you doing? She's like, I'm going for a walk with the baby. And I'm like, okay, like yeah. if that's, if, it, if you're able to do it, cool mom, if you need help, like just let me know. <laughs> that's um, awesome. My mom, uh, a lot of times, so like I remember a couple months ago, uh, my mom sat down and I, after we got done teaching class and I actually did the class, the adult class that day because I was able to, um, I came back and I told my mom, I was like, man, like I, you haven't watched me train like in so long, like, you know, how did I do? And she was the first one to be like, isn't that block supposed to be like, <laughs> I was like and I was like, okay. I was like, well, yeah. and she's like, my mom's like, get back on the floor. Like, let me see. That. <laughs> and my mom oh. been, oh, karate moms. Yeah. Like I grew up with a karate always, mom. I understand. She does it. She's always been the one to tell us, like, I kind of feel like I've seen you do that better. Um, and I'm going to say like, from that point, like my mom, um, I always say it all the time. Uh, so as special as it is to have uh, three black belt martial artists in our family with the fourth being my mom, uh, my mom has the hardest job because at one point, everyone's ego at like a family party will get into it. And it's like, man, my dad starts it off. If I was 20 years younger, I'll take both of you on. Right. And, then, and then I sit there and I'm like, dad, like I'm a grown man now. You don't want this. Like, I'm, 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 it's a story. So my mom's the first one to be like, everyone be quiet. You guys don't want no problem with me. Like, right, mom. Um, I love it. I say it also from a deeper layer. So uh, you were talking about do even that discipline to everything. Um, one thing my brother didn't touch on, and I'm going to show it from our point of view, but then we're going to talk about it from like a parent side of it. Yeah. Um, we were not just doing karate. We did baseball, he mm. did soccer, basketball, um, I did uh, bowling, soccer, and then baseball. And baseball for me, and, you know, Sam will also attest to this, like, you know, we were, got blessed enough that, like, the athletic ability we built through karate, it carried us in our other sports. Sure. So it's not like we just did baseball from March to June. It's like March to June, then we're on travel teams. So it's like from June to August. Then we're playing fall ball from August to November. Mind you, like, you know, you look, think about it, we're still fitting time in for karate, time mm. for school. Um, and then still time for us to be still be kids, right? Because we don't want to lose that aspect. I want to go out and hang out with friends. I want to go ride my bikes. And then looking at it from the parent side of it, you know, driving through again with that discipline, mom and dad, they never once ever told us, no, you can't play baseball this year. It, wow. We never heard that. They always were like, like, and it was always just Angel, you're playing baseball this year. At one point, it wasn't even like if I wanted to. I could have said, well, I'm tired this year. I don't want, it was like, my mom was just like, okay, I signed you up. You start this, this week. And it wasn't even a question. And my dad made it a point to tell us like, you're not going to just sit around. Like we don't do that in this family. And my, you know, my dad's a little old school. So he's like, you don't do that in this family, brother. Like you're going to, you got to make sure you work. You're going to, my dad said it. Like, if you think you can't play basketball and do karate, what are you going to do when you have a job? And then you right. have to take home work. Like my dad always yeah. was able to bring it back to just like, what are you gonna do when you have a job? What are you gonna do when you have a family and a job? What do you, and then as we see like now, the family and the job, I just got a job. <laughs> I'm able to sit here and say, man, thank God, my dad was able to really like instill these disciplines in me because now I take it with me everywhere. Totally. And when we talk about the job thing and, and being able to balance, before we hopped on with you, I was setting up the computer and I'm like, oh, so what do you have to do after this? Because I'm like, oh, maybe we'll train, we'll get some rounds in. Cause that's, that's like randomly, we will just do that. Sure. Like, of the normal schedule, just be like, all right, well, let's do it right now for 30 minutes because 30 minutes is like nothing out of your day. So to say it goes by super quick. He's like, no, I got to grade some papers. And it like, it reminded me like, man, yeah, he's like working, working now, you know, like <laughs> he's like my little brother, but like, you got you grown man responsibilities mm. respect i like that go grade those go grade those papers do that work <laughs> so so yeah so those are just like those things um i think it, it just really shows when people see our family um i the first thing everyone always says is man how do you get so much time to like go yeah. and do all these activities you guys seem like you're always busy but the real truth of the matter is it's like we do it as a family so to us it, we're not busy we're actually with each other we're mm. with the family so for us it's, cool. our, it's our time to still um you know get away from the martial arts sense because sometimes we need to break that up sure. and just sit back and let's just have a good time let's go watch the band play let's 
let's just do it as a family. And that's really what makes us such a tight knit group. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, now you talked about, you've talked about the good, you've talked about the support, but Sam, you mentioned, you, you use the word skeletons, you know, so you, you, you open that, you open that door a crack and I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to push it wider. I can't imagine that there haven't been challenges with a family that's this close. That sounds like is, is probably pretty open with yeah. each other. And, you know, especially as you two were younger, that age gap. Yeah. How did that surface, you know, give, give us, give us some of that. And how did you work through it? Okay. Well, we, um, some like the age gap when we, as I said earlier, the, as Angel and I have gotten older, the gap has gotten smaller. Sure. There's more that we can do together, obviously. Um, but there was a, a point in time where your brothers and people are competitive. So there was a little competitive streak between us, even though there was a age gap, as we get closer, there is a little bit of a, a um, all right, well, I wanna try and top the other person, mm -hmm. which that's natural and that pushes you. And that's what brothers do and it is what it is. And, sure. and we actually, um, this past weekend, I competed at a tournament. Um, Angel wasn't able to go because he, play he talk about still playing sports and stuff like we both play softball but he like plays like travel softball it gets paid for it's crazy like, i didn't even know that was a thing ex yeah. exactly i neither did i so he told me about it i'm like yeah whatever then i'm like oh he really showed me the money i was like oh you're actually getting paid to play softball this is insane <laughs> but um but you know i i went to a tournament this past weekend and when i got done with the tournament it was a great event in uh, litchfield connecticut it was or i'm sorry it was in new milford connecticut thrown by litchfield tom sudo so it was uh master mrs and mr mr and mrs krantz um and and they both own, own the dojang there and they threw a great event and um i did pretty well at the tournament but i i won grants for forms won grants for weapons i lost in overtime for fighting and then immediately he's like oh well you know what happened and blah 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 like came down afterwards like it made me feel some type of way and i had to go angel hey, you know i thought i did pretty well that day like you know, but we had to talk through it so sure. To be able to do that last night, that comes from other points in our lives where we had to, where we both might have been hard on each other or trying to one up. And then we learned how to talk through it through maturity. When Angel mm -hmm. was talking about, you know, when, when my father, myself, him, everybody's together and my dad with them, if I was 20 years younger, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I'm mostly the quiet one at those stages. I'm just like, whatever, dad, whatever, Angel. Like, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's funny, but though the skeletons that we've all went through were able to joke like that because there's been a lot of things i myself you know I, i'm pretty transparent about things that i've went through um with everybody because everything happens for a reason and i tried my best to use my experiences to help others to do better in their next stages in life um so i myself you know i was married for for three years and then went through a really rough divorce um and in that time that was an experience that for the family, as close knit as our foundation, as we are, and as strong as our foundation is, you know, it, it shook the ship a lot because what marriage is and the institution that that is, you know, that that you're bringing someone into the circle, so to say. That's how my father talks about the circle. You bring someone in the circle. Now there, now there's a break in there. So how do we repair? You have to work through those things. And those are those skeletons that if somebody was to watch us and they didn't, they didn't know like my story, for example they wouldn't ever have thought that. They're always surprised like, oh, wow, you went through, because you know, with the right support systems, you may be able to work through things and you overcome and become better than you were before, mm -hmm. you know, stronger than you were before. But that, that's a tribute to the family and through going through things over the years. So that way you learn how to work through them, how to deal with them, and then how to adjust, adapt and overcome. So that way in the long run, the family's better off which is, the, that's a blessing in itself, so. Okay. Um, so I'll give it to you from- Yeah, yeah, give, give me the other, give me a different perspective. Um, so for me, so we talk about the age gap, right? The age gap to me didn't uh, really mean anything until I took competing in karate more seriously, mm. okay? When, when was that? How old were you? So I was uh, 14 years old. I did a uh, Chizik Tang Sudo tournament in Connecticut. Twelve, man. No, no, no. You were no, white belt still. No, 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 sir. No, no. When I took it serious. Oh, okay. <laughs> I see. I got the picture. <laughs> see, I got the picture. This right? is so it's perfect, right? So now, it's like, like, absolutely. Jesus, <laughs> takes to no tournament. I was, um, I was 
13 going on 14 because my birthday's in October. Um, so I was already in high school freshman and I already did a few tournaments. Now, this is for people that don't know this. He forced me to do tournaments. Mm -hmm. I was the first one that would hit age one tournament. No. And he'll just, and he'll, what are you going to do? Nothing. I just don't want to go. I just, and, and then it got to the point where I was like, well, I'll just watch you. And he was like, but you don't want to like, no, no, I just, dude, I get, I have fun watching you. So I would just go and watch him. But little did I know that that, me just saying I was going to go watch him was already gearing me towards that way. Yeah. Um, and what people, and now this is where like, I really found my identity. I always say, um, was I did this tournament, cheese, like Tang Sudo. Um, I ended up getting third and I told him the next, like the next day, Hey, I want to go to that tournament in Hamden. And that tournament mm -hmm. in Hamden was nutmeg state nationals. Oh, it was a, big, it's a biggie. Yeah. yeah you remember yeah, it was a biggie. Big and so he, right away was like you want to do the tournament i'm like yeah, yeah i'm gonna do the tournament and he was like okay all right and he didn't say nothing he didn't like have me work extra hard he just left me and just said okay like you want to go do the tournament do the tournament i went i ended up placing second in uh kata i placed uh second in fighting and then they had continuous and he looks at me he says all right i was like well, this guy asked me to do continuous he's like do you even i was like i'm gonna do continuous and he was like okay and he just all he said to me was Listen, I just need you to just keep your hands up and just punch. I didn't know what continuous was. <laughs> and he said, he just told me, he goes, think of like dojo sparring. But he got to see that day that like, mm. I have a lot in me. So mm. I just went and I was like only, I think a yellow belt at that time. And I was fighting brown belts. And Beat. they let you do it. Yeah, because it was open rank. Yeah, the I used to love those continuous divisions. Yeah. Then when they started making them open rank, I was like, man, it's getting dangerous yeah. because you it get works. everybody and everybody throwing whatever they want. So <laughs> what happened was as a yellow belt, I go through, I had to fight a blue belt, I beat him. I fight a brown belt, I beat him. I fight like another green belt, I beat him. I get to a black belt and I got destroyed. <laughs> and I was like crying. And he's over here saying, you did awesome. And I'm like, I lost, dude, I'm so sorry. Yeah. But from there... I was like, well, I want to go do this tournament. Now, this is why I say I found my identity. This is where the gap came in. I said, I just wanted to win a six-foot trophy because you got a six-foot trophy. Mm -hmm. And I went, we went to Karate Tournament of Champions, uh, Team KTOC. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Went there, and I will never forget, I was fighting, wor working my way through the division. I ended up fighting a person that was smaller than me, and I'm hitting him super hard. And he was like, calm down a little. And I told him in the fight, no one's going to take this trophy away. And I went back and I just kept fighting hard because I always felt like my thing was I would hit too hard and then I'll be too soft. And then I would mm -hmm. end up like losing because I'm like, no, but I don't want to hurt no one. So it wasn't that I wanted to hurt. I just wanted to win that bad. Sure. After that, we came to the school and I'll never forget. I was like, you got a six foot trophy. I got a six foot trophy now. <laughs> mm -hmm. But then after that, I was like, I started thinking about it and I didn't do another tournament for a couple months. And I told myself, man, like, you know, I, I think I can do exactly what he's doing. Now, this is where the skeleton, the Kazakh comes from. At that time, my brother was really known as everyone knows for his weapons and his kata. Mm -hmm. So everyone thought I sucked at fighting. And for me, it, 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 it still eats at me to this day. If someone says like, Oh, you're the kata guy. And for me, I'm like, no, I'm just a martial artist. Like, I don't, mm. like, don't, don't put me in a bracket. It gets me upset. And I get mad when people do it to him. I say he's a triple threat. Like, you guys, you can't put someone in one stage because you do that at too young of an age. You're going to brainwash the mind to think, sure. well, this is all I'll ever be good at. Absolutely. So for me, I made it such a point, man, I'm going to win every kata and every fighting division. And as I grew up, I heard people say, you didn't do as bad today. And then that used to just fuel the fire, right? Yeah. So then at that time, my brother saw I was a little bit more serious. On Wednesday nights, we went to Mike Conroy's school in uh, East Haven, American mm -hmm. Martial Arts. Mm -hmm. So we went there, and my brother got to see it really come out that I was like, I didn't care how old you were, how tall you were, what belt you were. I'm going to hit you really hard. I'm going to try and be the best. And it came down to there's some nights they had to, like, break us apart. Because uh, we – Talk, talk about that, because that that's yeah. – one of the things I want to talk about today is you, I bet if we looked at it now and we look over the last few years, there has been a healthy level of competitiveness that has helped each of you thrive. Okay. You've pushed each other, Definitely. but I can't imagine it started there. No, no, there was, you know, there was a point in time. So I'll pick up where he, where he just stopped that with the, going to, to coach sure. Conway's, um, you know, I, I had started going there on my own and then started bringing him young. I would bring him sporadically, 
um, like when he had a break from school. And, and how old were you at that point, Angel? When I first started bringing you, you were like 14. Yeah, I was four. I was okay. four. Yeah, he was like 14. And this was like black belt men yeah. class. And I would just bring him. I'm like, come on. And coach, you know, coach was like, absolutely bring him down. I don't care. Yeah, whatever. As long as, you know, he, he can hang. And I'm like, coach, yeah. And he spars with me at the dojo. He's like, all right, fine. You know, because <laughs> I know you guys want to do the traditional stuff, so I'm sure he could he could take a hit and give a hit. So fine. And um, so I would bring him on breaks on his winter break, spring break. Mm-hmm. Then when he was going into college, that's when we started going more consistently, like all the time, especially that he ended up going to Southern. And um, that competitiveness at first, yeah, when he there 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 had to be growth on both ends. I feel like for me specifically, there was a point in time where there was growth of me understanding that. Yeah, he's your little brother, but he's growing into a man. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a balance in how you spar with him. You can't spar with him like he's the little kid because he's starting to get stronger. He's starting to hit. But then when I would get hit, my ego would flare up. And then like the one thing that he tells people, but I try to tell him, don't tell people about it, (laughs) be a surprise, is that I just I'll sweep everybody and anybody. Like I'm a that was Sensei Bennett is known for sweeping and that was one of the biggest things that he instilled when, in me was like I'm gonna show you how to sweep from different angles and take anybody down so when when he would do that and my ego would flare then that's when it would start to sweep and boom and we would start like really going at it and um and there was one night in particular where um coach Conroy's wife Mel was there watching and she saw us go at it that she got crying. like she cried and she got scared because she's like no but you guys are brothers why are you doing that blah 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 and it wasn't necessarily that we were angry at each other. It was just brotherly egos that start just doing this all the time. Mm. Start butting heads like two like two rams that we got our we have our horns locked in and we're just going at each other. And what happened over time was that there was a there's been a mutual respect of we don't have to go that hard with each other, but at the same time we still understood how to push and how to hit how to give a hit to let the other person know like, yo, you were too close or you cut that angle wrong or you dropped your hand. So yeah, I'm going to backfist you in your forehead, Mm -hmm. but I'm not going to backfist you in your nose or whatever. And that those those moments um, have really shaped what the relationship has become as training partners now. I'm I'm sure. And like, for example, for me, there was coming, coming off the heels of that divorce, Mm -hmm. you know, I was getting ready for a tournament that I was supposed to go to in London. And I was at my heaviest ever. I was like 215 or something. <laughs> like, I just like, I was training, but not really training. I was eating like crap and, you know, doing a lot of bad stuff, drinking alcohol, which is completely unlike me. You were mourning, processing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. We're grieving the moments. Yeah. And I, when, I, when I was getting ready to go, he was telling me like, I was like, man, I'm just going to fight heavyweight because I'm never going to drop weight and blah, blah, blah. He's like, what do you mean? You have like eight weeks. You could do it in this. And we started training together at a different level at that point. He pushed me. He mm-hmm. forced me. So he forced me to go do a tournament that I didn't want to do. Because he brought me to, it was at King Gauchos. Which one? King of New York. King of New York. He brought me to King of New York. And he's like, hey, I just, he, he told me like the, <laughs> that week, it was, the tournament was like Saturday. And I like Monday, he's like, oh, I registered you for a tournament this week. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, it's King of New York. And I'm like, yo, I don't, what are you doing? I'm not even really training it. No, 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 we did enough. Just come on, let's go. You need to get out and do a tournament. But that broke the ice and that got you in the ring, got me moving, whatever. Sure. But those moments have laid that foundation down where the egos have been put aside and we're able to train with each other, push each other. And at most tournaments, there's a lot of times where we're going to tournaments, specifically at Battle of Atlanta. He, we're going out there. He's like, let's do as many divisions as possible. So we did this double elimination. We did tag team sparring with each other. Then we did this double elimination division. And he's like, let's try to clean out the double elimination division. And it's just you and I at the end. And I was like, oh, all right. So I was like, what's the double elimination? He's like, well, it's just 18 plus and everybody's together. And I was like, well, man, I'm like twice the age of most of these people. Like, I'm not going to be able to spar with them. Yeah, come on, let's do it. And sure enough, at the end, it ended up just being him and I. Oh, nice. <laughs> I just want to add oh, one more. Yeah, yeah. I always leave so <laughs> first off, um, just saying like how you, we had those skeletons. So I always say it, um, and he knew about it. And I told him when I was young that I started seeing um, at like in my high school years, like how we were always going at each other. Mm-hmm. And 
my mom and my dad and my mom especially my dad especially they always said like you guys are brothers like do mm -hmm. make sure you're working with each other and again we're back to discipline and that's i think that's gonna be the theme of this is that we're always gonna go back to like how deeply rooted this discipline is in our family yeah. so i used to always i used to always cry whenever we did that because i'm like man like mom and dad they're gonna yell at me like i'm always like the one who has started and at one point i just realized like man like there's a way we can i can still be competitive but it doesn't have to be towards him but i'm just gonna chase the shadow and i still say it to this day the shadow was he made it to i saw him make it to the stage i was there when he went to his first time he made it to stage and he was in 2011 2012 when he was in every single fighting grand weapons grand and kata grand and every tournament I was like, oh, I'm going to do that one day. Then it started moving that way. So I told myself, well, I have, in order to get to his level, I got to win these tournaments. And I won them as underbelts. And I said, okay, now I got to do it again as a black belt. And then it got to the point, like now for me, it's like, well, I want to make it to the stage as many times as he did, right? Then it's like, I want to, I got to win my division as many times as he did. Then now my biggest thing is I want to be the one that's going to win like that NASCAR overall for us. And now I always say it, it's for us because when I see him win, I'm the first one to be like, oh, he did it. There we go. <laughs> like off the divorce, it was his first time winning a NASCAR overall 30 plus. Mm. And I was the one who, who was the loudest in the room saying like, oh, he's back. Like if you guys thought he was gone, this man is back. Like, and, I, and, I, and me being the brother that I am, I was like, you should be afraid. You should be afraid. <laughs> I can see you doing that. I can totally but, see but it. But everyone, everyone knew like, everyone, some people knew what happened. So they knew like, I'm doing it because I'm just like, yo, he, it, it's, he's there. Like now oh, I got God. my brother back. Like, let's yeah. get, let's get rocking and rolling. Yeah. And what I want to say off of just everything he was saying was on top of, us seeing the growth the that tournament i registered him for was where yeah. i got to see the growth um, on my end because i realized like this is at a time more than any that he needs me to be that supporter that backbone that he needs me there and if i i gotta i gotta find different ways to show him like you're still this amazing person like you can still do these mm. things and with the tournament it really was just to show him like you still got it like this is dill i like i make the nickname he's vino like the wine he gets better with age so i say that because at that battle of atlanta he does he won't say this but it we were matched with each other the second fight of the bracket i fought and then i had to fight him the next round so i look at mm -hmm. him and i was like all right i'm gonna bow out to you and he goes well no well i'll you i'll bow to you you get to the first place match and i'll work my way up <laughs> Yeah. So I told him, now this goes back to support and mm -hmm. what, where the growth we have, right? I could have said, yeah, bow out to me. I'm going to go to first. I looked at him in his eyes in the ring. And I said, no, yesterday I told you, you're going to get to the first place match. I'm going to lose and I'm going to work my way back up to you. I'll beat them and get back to you. And I'm going to bow out to you again. You're going to win this. So he looked at me. He goes, okay, if you think so. We so bowed out. He ended up winning his next match, gets the first place. I had to work my, I didn't have not one break. I had to fight seven <laughs> fights back to back to back to back. And I'm saying like, I'm sitting there. He, they're like, give me like a minute. And he's like, all right, take a full minute. I drink a Garrett. All right, let's go. He's an angel, but right. I was like, no, 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 dude, I'm hot right now. We have to just keep going. Yeah. So we work our way back up. And at the end, I bowed out to him. And I told him when I bowed out to him, I said, you can do it. You're still the best fighter I know. So like, I know you can do it. So when he talked about, I came down hard on him from the tournament. It's always because I'm like, Sam, but you're like the best fighter I know. Like, I don't, I, I know you can pull it out of you. What, what I'm hearing, what I'm hearing, you know, you talked about that, that tournament, that New York tournament and, yeah. and, and a little bit of what you're talking about there with, with Battle of Atlanta is this interesting transition from a very obvious separation, you know, older brother, younger brother to something that's a lot closer to peers. Yeah. yeah absolutely. And now, and, and, and I knew we would get there at some point in, in the journey. But what we're hearing now is now you have mutual support and balanced, sustainable support. And, you know, Sam, you kind of mentioned it, that, you know, fighting at a high level is kind of a, a young man's game. And not that you're, I mean, I, you're younger than I am, but you see a lot of, you know, it's a, it's a lot of 18 to 25 year olds in those divisions that are really successful because it takes a lot out of you. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But what I'm wondering, because you have that that age gap, which now in my mind has become an asset, mm-hmm. because you have to train with a much younger guy. And oh. Angel, you're getting the experience mm-hmm. yeah. of your older brother. How far can you guys take this? It's it's like this this interesting best of both, but you're on the same team. Yeah. It, so uh, here, I'm going to set it up for you. I got you. So I say this to everyone um, when they are, when they end up like looking at us train, I tell everybody, right? We have the best setup. And I say that because I have the hardest and best puncher that I know that I've been in the ring with that I can see, but I tell him all the time, you'll never find anyone that's going to kick like me. And I tell him that with confidence because I tell him like, Sam, like I worked so hard on kicking. And then because of you, you, you've made my hands something that people, when they forget, I can punch. And then they're like, Whoa, like you can do both things. Like, again, we talk about a day. Everyone wants to say, Oh, you're a kicker. I'm, I'm now getting put in a category that people go like, well, Angel can like 360 you, he can backfist you, or he can kick you. It all depends. So it's set up like that's our asset. Our asset is that. And then let's pile on top of it. I have the best weapons and forms guy that I know I've ever seen. So with it, at the end of the day, there's no stone left unturned here. Yeah. But we, we, um, in terms of like the training that you were saying, um, Angel sometimes like we have different methods to our training. <laughs> He's like, so, so. Hey, Angel just fell off camera. I just want yeah, everybody well, listening he, to know that. He, he, he literally fell off camera with laughter. <laughs> this is going to be good. He, um, I, I, I've never, I've always hated to run, but then I found something that was keeping me young to be able to try and keep up with him was going on long runs. So like there was one day he, I put up a post and he texted me. He's like, what's your problem? And I'm like, what do you mean? I get back from a run. I'm trying to cool down. What's he talking about? He's like, why are you going to run 15 miles? Are you crazy? And I'm like, no, but it's because it keeps my, my joints lubricated or whatever I said to him. And he's like, I was like, you should come one day. He's like, listen, I don't run more than three miles. Anything after three miles doesn't matter. And I was like, what do you mean? Oh, no, I've studied the science, blah, blah, blah. When it comes to training, the way that he was talking about my father, the hoodie, the this, the that, it's hot. That's me. Like, I, I inherited that from him. Right. That, I'm like, oh, it's 95 degrees. It's the perfect time to run with a hoodie on and oh. sweatpants and like three shirts underneath. <laughs> but I, I do that to try and stay young with him because when I go with him to spar with Bailey and Brandon's and Romani's and all the, all the young guys that are coming out right now that have been around but are starting to flourish from this Northeast area, it's like I, I in order for me at my age to try and keep up with them, to the best of my abilities, which is still not keeping up with them, that to the way that he's able to do it, they're able to do it with each other. I need to, I need to run these 15 miles. I have to do some sprints. I have to do all this non-martial arts training to be able to perform in martial arts, that cross training, you know? And um, and the the whole mindset of being able to do everything and not being placed in a category, that was something that I've drilled into him when he was younger because you know before we even started the the podcast now we you know we were having our our offline conversations and one of the things that we all touched on was that balance of life and it came in at the beginning of this podcast the balance of working all day running a karate school at night and then trying to also find time to train that that becomes tough but the biggest piece when you're trying to stay competitive at an elite level there's to some there's a mindset where you have to Focus on one thing if you really want to be truly great at it. And there, that does hold some weight, I feel. But it also, it depends on your work ethic and how far are you willing to push yourself and drive. Because you look at the Kevin Thompsons, those are people I look up to. You know, my Sheehan, Sheehan Errol Bennett, you know, these guys were doing it all. Bill Beeson was out there sweeping everybody. I tried, every time I could try and find an old tape or whatever, I'm trying to study him. Because they were, they were doing kata, they were still doing kumite, and they were winning and being elite at everything, and well into older ages as well. And there's, there, you know, even though the sparring right now has become a lot faster paced sparring, and it's a sure. different type of fight um, than what, what I came up doing and what it used to be. Um, and it's certain elements, I tell people, I'm like, I feel like there's a little less karate in it, and it's, it's more leaning on the athleticism side and cutting angles, understanding those aspects of it, 
but sure. you're not necessarily always hitting with the cleanest karate technique. But even though you touch first, you got a point, whatever, that's what the game is now. But the way that it's transitioning at that faster pace, that cross training is essential. And being able to train with younger people and have the balance of the two. So when, when, when I started up the dojo, when, when, so our dojo that we have is Stratford Shotokan Karate. And I, I'm two points that when we started it that I wanted to make was like, one, this is never going to be Samuel Diaz karate. Mm. That we are going to pass on a traditional martial art to the best of our abilities, the way that it was taught to us. Mm -hmm. We're not going to customize it to whatever we want. So Stratford is the town that we're from that we, that the dojo lo is located in. So it's Stratford Shotokan. Uh, Shotokan being the style for any people that are non-martial artists that are listening or watching this podcast. Shotokan is the style of martial arts that we that we teach, that we train in. But when we passed, when, when we started the dojo, I really wanted to make sure that the understanding that there's three facets to your training, you have your kihon, your kata, your kumite, but then you also are going to have your koburo, you'll have your weapons, but we always practice everything. We will never just focus on one because we don't, we want to be a true martial artist. So that was something that when he was younger and then he started getting serious about his tournaments, I was like, you're always going to do kata. I'll be flexible on if you want to do a weapon at a tournament. Fine. You don't want to do it. Okay. But you will always do kata and you will always do kumite. We are never going to do one or the other. You will always do both. And I tried to lead by example with that as well. Um, and pass that on to our students here. Sure. Angel, Angel's athletic ability, when I saw him young training, there was one time he was, he was testing for purple belt and he was on break from school. And I said, listen, I had just gotten back from special training um, through the organization that I, that I've gotten my done rank through, which is Shodakan Karate of America. I just got back from special training with them, which is a training camp, like four days. And, you know, we don't have to talk too much about that, but it's four day training camp. He's coming back on break. And I said, you're going to test this week. And he's like, oh, okay. And I'm like, well, what, what day is it? I'm like, it's the whole week. Every day I have something planned for you. And he had to train for a week with me just privately outside of regular class just to attain his purple belt. Mm -hmm. But in that training, I saw elements in him that I was like, you know what? I'm going to take what I'm seeing on the circuit and the areas that I know that I lack in. And let me try to develop him in those areas. So that way, when we have our dojo and the dojo's flourishing as a team, we're able to offer the best to all of our students and to our community which is now what is finally coming into play of yeah. in flourishing, myself flourishing. Now the dojo offers so much more. We're no longer a dojo that, or we never really were, but we're not a dojo. Somebody's like, oh, if you want to learn really good katas or weapons, just go there. No, they're like, oh, if you want to train at a dojo that's legit, that's the only one to go to if you're in that area. Mm -hmm. and we've had the same way that Angel and I and my father, we were going 45 minutes an hour to go train with our Shihan in the Bronx, New York. <clears throat> we've had students specifically Frank Moses, because he just came and visited us last week, that he, Frank lived in the Bronx and was driving down to us to come trade. Nice. It, you know, it, that, that reversal of life coming full circle, yeah. but it's because of the product that you're trying to offer, the training that you're trying to give. And you truly have to lead with your heart and be the example for others if you really want to offer a pure product um, to, to your students, you know? Sure. So let's, um, let's play out a hypothetical. You know, if if the family dynamic continues to get passed down, mm -hmm. you know, your your kiddo there yeah. may start training at some point. Right. So yeah. let's let's not talk about, you know, two, three, four years old. Let's talk about 10, 12, 15, 18 years old. You know, for each of you what would you hope is going on, right? Because you've both benefited from the other significantly. I, I think, you know, we're, we're all on the same page there. And, you know, we're not getting the, the aspect of your father coming in here, but, you know, you've benefited from him, not just in life, but as martial artists, I'm sure he would see the, say the same. So now, you know, hopefully some point in the future, we're adding another Diaz into the family, into the family trade, maybe starts competing if you could sketch it out you know as a, a filmmaker as an author what would you hope that did for this family trade of karate in all of the various ways you want to start yeah sure. okay so 
Uh, I <clears throat> what I hope it starts is um, and, and especially you know now that we we get to see we get to see it especially like it's mm-hmm. always been talked about seeing it like now like he has his son like I have a nephew so now like everything I do it, it's so imperative that he gets the right look and he gets to see you know the story gets told the right way to him mm-hmm. um I want I would really want for him to just see if we're gonna even say in a competition standpoint in any standpoint um whether it's in the ring it's outside the ring it's at the competition stage or it's just you walking down the street you're always doing that right thing Mm-hmm. And I, and I say that really because, um, everyone that kind of knows and the seminars I've done this year, the, the other interviews, I've always said this, um, it's always about making sure we're more than just a kick and a punch. And um, I'm sure you've seen me at the e circuits. I always, I've, you've never once seen me push a kid away and nope. say like, no, I can't talk today. Like I'll almost be ready to fight. Like I know the next bracket up and I'm having a conversation how are you doing? Like all oh, this, take a picture together with my head gear on, with everything on. And an angel, come in and fight. Okay, I got you. And I'll actually tell me, like, give me one second. And then I'll just go. Whether <laughs> win or lose, I always come back to the conversation and pick it I've right. I've seen it. Up. And for me, it, that's just always been such an important part. So I would really want, as a comp- like as we're talking about it, just what I hope it plays out. Um, the main things for me on my end as like the uncle, um, making sure you're doing the right thing in and outside of the competition floor but then also um i we push this a lot um he doesn't have to do a tournament he mm-hmm. doesn't have to step in mm-hmm. to go and say like well i need i have to go and compete that's that he doesn't have to we're perfect i'm i am would you be just as happy as you training in the dojo floor giving me your 100 percent, no matter what it looks like i know you're giving me 100 percent but then I know outside you're doing everything you're supposed to be doing. And you're not only just doing the right thing, but you're also impacting others the same way that I was able to impact you. Yeah. And that's what I look for. We, um, the, the, so outside of the karate stuff, you know, the, like I said before, that our family has always been very involved in the community. Sure. Um, and I, myself, I work for um, Southwest Community Health Center. I'm their chief strategy officer there. So I'm always looking for elements of where, where are there gaps in care and the health equities for our community and disparities and how can we bridge that and what can we do? And that carries into the dojo and that same mindset carries forward. Mm-hmm. So in terms of, of my son, the, so for those that don't know my son, his name is Samuel Diaz the fourth. So when we're talking, when you're asking this question about carrying on and adding to the family, yeah. it's like he's carrying on a name also. So, um, and we wanted to do that. Big shoes to fill. Oh, when you do that yeah you know it's like I, I just I wanted to more pay homage to my father and sure. my grandfather and you know what that is and, and there's not many fourths around anymore no I, I think no, it, I it be kind of cool and unique in a way even though it's not unique it is unique when someone sees it or hears it um but having him like Angel said do the right thing impact the community use the martial arts that he learned for good um, and the elements from the karate that he learned, whether that's the discipline, the respect, the, the everything, you know, um, being able to for, to have the fortitude, mental fortitude to overcome things, facing adversity, whatever it is, to carry that and help to instill those skills in other people, even if it's not through training. So that'll be then by leading by example. Um, and then if we were to circle back to competition, if he did want to compete, because that was more of the element of your question, if he did want to compete, I think that hopefully he'll be the one that kind of pulls it all together because mm-hmm. my, my foundation, my background is more on the traditional element. Angel's foundation background was more with the sport karate is where I started him with that type of sparring, even though he was traditional in how we train, I put more sport karate elements into mm-hmm. his sparring style. Um, hopefully, hopefully Sam will be the one that bridges it together where he can go to a traditional tournament, do his thing. he go to a sport karate tournament, do his thing go into a kickboxing match and do his thing whatever it is because he'll have both of us being able to kind of like answer questions give him strategies train him sure. in different ways um and then also you know doing doing the weapons the kata his key hunt everything he'll be able to pull it all together um which will be really nice because we all you know we all need that that example to to follow and sure. as the generations go on as long as the example stays strong that next generation is going to be even stronger which now when you go down three, four lines, because by the time Sam's 14, 15, Angel might have a child himself. So now the, 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 
the clan is building yeah. this thing, you know <laughs> building an army yeah <laughs> there's an army going on here and, uh, i like it the best thing also um something i just realized right now as we said this um the best thing about the fact that we were just saying like by that time I, hopefully i'll be having a kid by then is that now we can teach uh his son teach my son or daughter how to use that gap as a positive and never as because yeah. yeah. we can say like we've done it like your uncle is 11 years older than me it's very like and i know there's you know there's always gonna be stories like how like how did you guys make this work did you ever see him do this did you ever see him do that so now we can like kind of guide them and then and still certain things early that we wish we could have done if we would have known at that time yeah we had to learn through experience a yeah little bit, so. totally which would be nice here's a question this one just came to me a little little different and i want you to think about it I, i'm gonna i want you to answer at the same time so let's imagine that that we had i don't know, a chunk of money or a car something fun on the line the two of you had to spar <laughs> okay and you ha you got the opportunity to limit what the other person was going to do so like angel you get to hold sam to only one offensive technique mm -hmm. sam you get to hold angel to one offensive i would assume you know either one of his worst or one that you're really good at defending against so think for a moment what that would be mm -hmm. And let me know when you're ready and then I'll count you down and you can you can let us know because this would be a really interesting match to watch. And I'm mostly excited to see the look on each other's each of your faces when you when you answer. That's that's what I'm looking forward. That's the whole reason we're doing this. Like I kind of uh, I, I got it. I have an idea of what he's gonna say for me. I got but, mine. Okay. Um, you said limit, right? He can't to, like he can like, the, like the one, like it's you know, it's it's when you pick up a brand new video like fighting game. You know, yeah. you grab somebody doesn't know how to play and they figure out they're like, I, I got this one move. <laughs> and all I got, I'm pressing That's these okay. buttons, one thing's happening. What's the one that you would want him to use? Because you know, it'd give you an advantage. Okay. Got you. I'm I know mine. I'm away. Okay. For all right, you got it. And it has to be you want it to be like a one word response. I mean, if it's a multi-word technique. Okay. 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 Are you ready? You got it? Yep. Yep. Okay. All right. So I'll count three, two, one, and then you guys go. All right. Three, two, one. Back reverse fist. punch left side forward. Okay. Sorry, but super specific. <laughs> reverse punch left side forward. Angel, you said back fist? Yeah, but now that he said that, back fist left side forward. Okay. Why? Oh, yeah. No. Why? Like, yeah. like <laughs> <laughs> no. Why? Because yes, you know what? Sense. Neither of those sound like terrible techniques. But, yeah. but <laughs> there's a reason. I'm sure there is. He's, he's kicking the one technique that I only throw out of desperation. And I'm kicking <laughs> the one technique that he never throws, no matter how much I yell at him. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. It's, so, and, and you know, the root of both of them, well, the reason why I picked it and the reason why I don't throw it, distancing. Yeah. So I reverse punch left side forward. He fights righty more often than lefty. Mm -hmm. And his distancing, we're still we're still adjusting to the distancing because we've been adjusting fighting styles and leg placement, um, leg spacing within himself and then leg right. spacing towards the opponent. Mm -hmm. So because he right now is still like we're figuring right. that out. I know that if he has a left side forward, the distancing is going to be off because yep. it's a different perspective. He's used to having right side. And for me, my I, my left side forward, I can hit you all day with a reverse punch with my, with my right hand, no matter where you're at. But you ask me to blitz or something with my left hand, that happened. Yeah. But if you ask me to blitz with my right hand, I'll hit you all day again with the back fist. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah so, I love I, it. So, I, <laughs> what, what we ended up doing was we ended up focusing on one body part. And mm -hmm. that's because we know with this specific body part, it's just not going to come out. And that's, that's exactly why, as soon as you said it, I thought, <laughs> that's why I was like, okay, well, he's not going to be able to sleep if he only has to throw this one technique. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go with his left hand back fist. Yeah. That is the one that will yeah. give me a heart attack as I coach him at a tournament. It will yeah. make me go crazy. <laughs> Listen, at some point, everyone will hear this. I'll be like, left hand back fist. All right, right there. Okay, right there. Then I will probably go, all right, just have fun. And then I just, I just say, I just, I kind of, I honestly, it's like my way of like, all right, I'll just shut up. It's fine. Like, you, I, you I've, I've had that experience on the sideline as well. It's like, you're not, 
you're just you're just ignoring everything I say. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna clap now. Yeah, we were we were in Florida earlier this year in February, I think, right? Yeah, February. We went we went out and visited uh, Murphy Gonzalez. Was it Murphy's tournament? That Starcade, is, right? Starcade. Yeah, we went out and visited Murphy Gonzalez's tournament, which is awesome. Like, if anybody who wants to like get some rounds in fighting, mm. go to Florida tournaments. Florida, there's awesome fighters out there, and everything's like double elimination. Oh, cool. And it's very fighting focused. Um, you know, you have your forms and your weapons people, but they are very fighting focused out there, which is which was a great experience. And I was fighting in my division and same thing. He's like yelling at me to do stuff. I'm not doing it. Or he's like, cut this angle. Why are you standing there? No, move backwards, <laughs> whatever. And out of nowhere, I decided to throw the guy was coming. For some reason, I thought it was a great idea. To like have my left side forward, fake an angle with my back leg, with my right leg, then do a spinning kick, a spinning hook kick into a blitz because I wanted to blitz with my right hand, but I can't do that if my left side's forward. So I'll spin, <laughs> position myself my right, shoot the blitz. Somehow it scored. And Cam Dawson's on the sideline. And what do he say to you? He looked at me, he goes, Yo, that was nice. Y'all practice that? And I look at him, I go, honestly, I have no idea what he's doing right now. I, <laughs> I don't even know what he's doing. This is and it was all because he's like, yo, just have fun. And I'll just like figure it'll just happen. Whatever happens, happens. Who cares? You know? But it's be it's all because it was like a way to avoid having to blitz with my left hand. You know, work. <laughs> and then and then after that, we get done. And I was like, so what did you do there? And he explains all that to me. And I go, Sam. All that thinking, and if you would have just blitzed with your left side, we could have skipped the whole entire thinking process. <laughs> like, literally, could have skipped the whole process, but it's fine. I got you. Yeah. So nice That was a good question. That was a good question. Nope, a question. I've never had anyone ask me that question before. That was awesome. That's <laughs> that's my goal. My goal is to give you something that, that's a little bit different. You know, you guys? That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's, let's wind it down here. Cool. And typically at the end of the show, you know, I say, Hey, you know, give, give, give folks some, some final words, but I know that, you know, you, you guys are ready to go with that stuff. So I, I want to find a way to put it together. So how about this? I want you to answer for each other. Cool. Kind, kind of, again, we'll, we'll, we'll take a play off what we just did. So I'm, I'm working through this. This is I'm, I'm thinking. I'm thinking because you you guys are challenging me here, right? I, I knew bringing the two of you on would be would be a little challenging. Perfect for everyone that's listening. This is awesome. You're getting this like raw, right? Now. Yeah. This is. Wow. I mean, this is probably uncut. Who knows how much cutting we're gonna do? <laughs> you know each other really well. Yeah. You know each other really. I mean, obviously, you know when the the the, the looks on your faces with with the techniques and just getting so specific. I mean, you you know each other. So this is really challenging for me because I don't like I don't like where I was going with that. <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm just gonna roll it back to the the original thing, which is you know what are your final words? Now I don't I I don't think there's a way that we can make this better. So we'll just you know you can't you can't improve on on your fundamentals. Gotcha. So we're gonna leave this as the fundamental to end on. We've been through a lot tonight. We've talked about a lot of really interesting stuff, different stuff. You've described an experience in the martial arts that very few people have experienced. They're never going to, right? Without, without that, that close-knit family structure, without the brother, without the, the age gap, right? It turns out really different. And that's why I'm glad we were able to have you on. What elements of that that people are not going to be able to experience would you want them to think about you know think about what you've taken from each other what you've learned why you're better how you're better who you are today because of the other and, and your family as a whole and knowing that most people listening and watching are not going to have an experience it's even close on those in those ways what might you encourage them to think about such that they can take some of it, such that they can learn from what you've experienced? And then we can 
send them off. I know, I know this this took a this took a deep turn. <laughs> yeah. But I, I have faith. It's a great question. Um I'm coming to something. I'm just trying to figure out how to put it together. Yeah, it's okay. All the thought, but I just want to figure out how to bring it together. I think maybe maybe one of there's a lot of things to take, but I, I think maybe one of the things that if we're relating it specifically to martial arts, but the 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 knowledge can can carry into other aspects of anyone's life. I think probably could be applicable to anything. Is that um, when you when you're working through things with someone who you care about, hmm. age, time, um, even the root of of whatever it is that you need to work through with them doesn't matter because the bond that you're going to create and strengthen will trump whatever an issue was. Um, and, and the reason I'm saying that this could transcend is because that's something that like, as you know, we spoke to you about what that, what the growth has been like for us in martial arts and sure. a, a moment in time where we would go at each other to now that being like, how can we take that energy to help each other both be better? going through life experiences where you need somebody and that person saying like no nah, i believe in you even though you don't believe in yourself right now i believe in you and what i still see in you even though you can't see it in yourself right now and i'm gonna do what i need to do to bring that out of you so now you can see it come to fruition once again or come to fruition at a level that you didn't even think was possible which is more so how it is for me i didn't get to touch on that after he said it but you know there there's there's elements to, to where I'm at now that I'm like, man, if anything, like I say it all the time right now with, with, with Debbie, who's, you know, my person, you know, my fiance, um, I say it all the time of like, you know, if only I could have been the way that I am now, 10 years ago, in terms of training, in terms of who I am, sky would have been the limit. I could have reached all these different levels, which is like, you would you would have never been able to been that, be that person because you didn't go through the things that you went through 10 years ago. You didn't have the yeah. support that you had 10 years ago. I didn't have the relationship that we have 10 years ago. It had to grow into this. So again, no matter what it is that you're going through, um, if you have a, a, a issue with your significant other, your brother, your sister, your, your, your parents, your cousins, taking the time to be transparent with each other, be vulnerable and work through those issues, no matter how uncomfortable it may be at that moment in time, is going to help to bring that relationship to a level that you could never have even imagined and develop a love and a bond that you couldn't have imagined could be possible. Because it, co it can only come through going through fire. Mm. You know, that's the only way it could come. Um, so it was well said. Thank you. Yeah, off of that, um, and I definitely agree. And so, um, and I'm gonna say it's more of like the younger siblings, um, especially when it's, you know, it's kind of hard to see the road. Uh, really, and I'm gonna say it's gonna sound so cliche, but trust the process that is happening between you and that significant other within your family, with, with your sibling, cousin, um, whatever that may be, trust that process. And I say that because um, we all need to sometimes take a step back and kind of understand that like as much as we may want to win and we want it to be about us and it's our time right um, you need to kind of look at it and just see like what is the best for both of us and you putting that into perspective and always leading with that type of attitude you're gonna get to where you want to go but that's where the pure satisfaction from that bond that you build comes from because now you get to see the person that you're with the person that you care about that you hold in the true value succeeding in where they want to succeed mm -hmm. and then that's where that growth and maturity comes in that we both may not have the same goal on this specific topic but you have your goal and i have my goal i want to help you reach yours and you want to help me reach mine so what is it going to take and is it going to have to be those transparent conversations 
Is it going to have to be that, like, we always talk about it all the time. Our communication is always going to improve, whether that's between tournaments, training sessions, or just in our everyday life. That communication, that bond you build, um, that's going to really set the groundwork. And then you're going to be able to take a step back, see the bigger picture and realize, you know, I don't just want to do this on my own side of things. I want to really do this with that person that I care about. Because now that I do that with the person I care about, I'm definitely able to now put that into perspective. And we both can end up being a, a great team. But on top of that, it's just being great together. And the team doesn't always mean about, you know, trying to win the tournaments and the titles. The team is just, did you have a good outcome? I had a great outcome. And I know for us, and just saying it again, like when we travel to tournaments, it's always about, did we make that tournament an experience? Mm -hmm. Forget about the, the championships we won, the money, all that extra stuff. It just makes it a bonus. But for me, especially like going to the tournaments and traveling, it's just like, what, what crazy trip can we have this time that we get to come home and tell everyone about? And then that's our memory. And you get to hold on to those memories and you know, when it's all said and done down the line, that's what we're always going to hold on to. Yeah, that was something that um, when Angel, Angel wanted to compete heavy in college. And I was always like, yo, the tournament's not going anywhere. Focus on school. Mm -hmm. Nah, but I can go to this. Eh, it's not going anywhere. Focus on school. Like, I will go to AKAs or whatever. And I would feel bad because I'm like, I know he wants to come, but focus on school because AKA is in his 50th year. It ain't going anywhere next year. It's going to be there and it'll be there the year after. But when he started breaking out and like getting out there to compete, the first thing I told him was like, you know, no matter where you go, make sure you're making a memory because at the end of the day, whether you won, you lost in 10, 15 years, that ain't even going to matter. Nobody's really going to care. But the memory that you had is really what will carry. And it took me a long time to learn that when I was first starting to compete. Personally, I had this like really cutthroat attitude of me versus everybody and like, you know, I, I was with my instructor, our dojo is very hardcore. Like you go in there and you could feel the pressure. You feel mm -hmm. that, like when it was fight night, there is no friends. It's like we are here and somebody's getting hurt. And it was a tough dojo, you know, really hardcore old school dojo. So then I carried that mindset in. And there was many years that like when I think back now, I'm like, man, I lost years in competing in terms of memories because I isolated myself. I felt that I have to be this cutthroat dude representing Connecticut, New York. And you are, nah, it doesn't have to be like that. You get in the ring, you handle business. But when you're outside of the ring, be personable, build your brand, be that person that Angel is saying that he is now when he's outside of the ring and there's a little kid that wants to talk and that be that person because that's the person that makes a bigger impact than the guy who won. Unfortunately, sometimes we get so fixated on that winning that you're not being the best role model when you win. And that parent that's on the sideline, they may be like, hey, he's a great athlete, but he's a crappy person. And that is that really who you want your kid looking up to? No, that's not, that's not who I would want my kid looking up to. That's not who I wanted to be. And, I, and when I realized I needed to shift, I never wanted him to be that person. And he's done a great job. You know, I'm super proud of all, all the work. And I tell people all the time, he's the hardest working guy I know because this dude's always training. Always, and he, he, you know, he had the time for it also. With, he just started working. So he was in school. Was, you got a lot of free time. But, but other, other people his age choose other ways to spend that time. And he's like, no, nah, I got to go to gym train. No, I have to go to the dojo. I have to work. Sam, can we work on this? Can we do that? Even if it's like, can you just hold this pad so I can work this angle? And then as I'm watching, I'll say, try this, move your leg that way instead. And we figure it out together. But that comes from somebody who's dedicated, somebody who, who really wants it and is hungry and trusting the process, as he said, is a big part of that game, you know? And that's in anything that you do, not just martial arts, trust the process of growth in, in your career, in school, eventually it falls into place. As long as you keep chipping away at it, it will fall into place. I absolutely loved this conversation, had a blast. I have the utmost respect for these two gentlemen and I, I bet you could tell, I, I think the world of both of them. And so having them on to talk about what it's like supporting, challenging, growing in a sibling family dynamic, as well as just their individual stories. You know, I'm glad we were able to bring it to you and I'm glad that they were willing to do this in video because I think it went so much better with it.
Now, if you want to check out the show notes, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Check out everything we've got going there. And just as an added bonus, if you haven't tuned out, see, we, we hide this stuff so people listen to the intros and the outros. We've got a special bit that came out of our pre-record session that I really liked. Actually, it was Andrew's idea. So we're going to drop that in on the end. So make sure you listen the next couple of minutes. If you want to support us, I said it at the top, you can buy something, Podcast 1-5. You can check out the Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. You can tell people about what we've got going on. You can leave a review. You can also buy a book on Amazon. Check out our training programs at whistlekickprograms.com. There's a ton of stuff. If it's something that you think might be beneficial to us, we are appreciative. So thank you to all of you who have done that. That's all I've got. So until next time, train hard, smile, stick around, and have a great day. It doesn't add up. No, absolutely. There was one when so when Angel was starting to come. I mean, I don't want. I don't, I don't want to kill the interview. Yeah, yeah. Like one of the things that we could talk about is like how I hit, how he had aspirations to like I want to be the best, and he still has. He still he grinds, man. But one of the things I had to break down for him, like on a piece of paper, one day was listen. This is what you'll make if you win your division. Then if you win lightweight grand, if you win overall grand. Now we'll multiply that by 10 tournaments a year. Now let's subtract travel costs, this cost, that cost. Next thing you knew, he was like, man, so you really only come out with like $4,000 profit. And I'm like, if that's if you win every single time. Yeah. Like, <laughs> right.